Hey everyone, it's Jason Smith back from Grand River Sports Medicine. Uh, we're going to talk about workload management today for another presentation and how we can maximize our performance and minimize injuries. Thanks for joining me again. You guys know who I am. You know who Sasha is. Uh, feel free to scope about our bios on the website if you want to know more. We're going to get right into it. The agenda for today, we're going to discuss what is workload management and why we should use it. What are acute loads, chronic loads, and the acute to chronic workload ratio, which is going to be a big important thing that I want you guys to remember. Uh, how do we track these training loads? And we'll chat about the difference between external and internal training loads. And what other variables should we consider when adjusting our workload uh, throughout the season, throughout the week, and in the off-season as well. So acute to chronic workload ratio. Uh, the acute load is the measurement of a training load over the course of one session, so one practice, for example, or one day. Uh, so you could add up the session loads. Let's say you're doing uh, two-a-day training sessions. That would be the daily load. The chronic load is an average measurement of the training load over the course of a longer time period, for example, three to six weeks. Uh, for our purposes today, we're going to use four-week intervals. Uh, the ac acute to chronic workload ratio is the ratio of acute work in relation to chronic work. Seems simple enough, self-explanatory, right? Uh, this ACWR captures how hard you're working in a session relative to how hard your body is prepared to work given the work you've put in in the past four weeks. So the whole idea of this is measuring that load within an individual session compared to how fit you are. And we don't want individuals to spike above their current fitness level, because that's typically when, when injuries occur. We'll prevent, present some uh, evidence to show you why that occurs. So ACWR provides us with a tool to monitor potential overtraining and undertraining, again, so we can maximize performance and minimize injury. Uh, the formula to calculate it, ACWR, is acute load over chronic load. And guys, this is very simple stuff. It may seem complicated because we're talking about math, but trust me, I'm gonna make it simple for you. Uh, Tim Gabbett is a primary researcher, uh, as well as Francois Casano in regards to workload management. So we'll, we'll be chatting about their research a lot throughout this presentation. Uh, Tim Gabbett says, rapid spikes in training workload is a problem, while consistent training loads are the solution. And again, keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that uh, concept of training consistency throughout the presentation, too. Um, again, there's research that has shown that the acute to chronic workload ratio, when properly used, can account for 53% of injury likelihood. So measuring that variable alone can explain over 50% of the injuries that occur uh, across a variety of sports. The other 47% are from other factors, and we're going to chat about what those are too, so we can take those into consideration. So how do we monitor training intensity and load? So we can do this through external load. So these are things like the amount of weight lifted if you're in the gym session, our sets, our reps, our frequency, you know, how often we're doing it, the activity time, distance traveled. Uh, for a hockey-specific context, we're going to present some research talking about on-ice load and on-ice load per minute that has to do with uh, the accelerations and decelerations that occur on the ice. And that's the, the best measure of external load we have right now in, in ice hockey. Internal load, uh, by, con by contrast, is a different measurement of you know, how the external load affects our bodies personally. So we can use something like a session rating of perceived exertion. So that's our rating of perceived exertion. How hard do we feel like we're working during that session times the number of minutes the session occurs. And that's what we're going to use. And we'll show some research that demonstrates that's the most effective way to, to measure this load in ice hockey players. You could also use things like heart rate, blood, blood lactate, heart rate variability, um, and some recovery, stress, and well-being questionnaires that are quite useful as well. Key thing to remember here, identical external training loads can elicit vastly different internal training loads in two athletes with different individual characteristics. Okay, So despite two hockey players going through the same exact same practice, their level of exertion can be vastly different depending on the level of fitness that they're coming into the practice with. And we want to control that level of fitness so we can tolerate as much work as possible. 
If any of you are uh, Raptors fans out there, you're familiar with Kawhi Leonard. Uh, this guy over the course of the championship season, you know, popularized the term load management uh, through working with his specific trainer. Uh, he had a recurrent knee injury and he sat out many games during the season. And they were trying to manage the load in regards to that knee injury in order to keep him ready for playoffs and the games that really ma mattered. Load management has been around for a long time, and uh, it's what we primarily do as physiotherapists when we're trying to, you know, keep athletes on the ice in regards to injury recovery. Um, and it's a very important aspect of it. So load management is essentially testing and tracking of training loads over the course of the season and managing these loads to maximize our performance and minimize injuries. Um, <clears throat> that includes a management plan for the season and adjusting these training loads on the fly, depending on the data that we're getting back. We'll also chat about the Goldilocks approach to training. I don't know if this book is popular anymore, but it was very popular when I was a kid. Goldilocks and the Three Bears. She breaks into Three Bears' house and she can't find the right porridge and the right bed. You know, one porridge is too hot, one porridge is too cold, the other porridge is just right. Same thing with the bed, too big, too small, just right. So the Goldilocks approach to training is we're not overtraining, we're not undertraining, we're getting it just right to get that progressive adaptation that we want to improve our fitness over time. So who uses this stuff? You know, there's plenty of examples of athletes uh, over the course of many different sports that are, are known for training consistently and for never getting out of shape. Um, some big ones that come to mind, Connor McDavid, if you guys ever have some time, there's a documentary about Connor McDavid's rehabilitation from his uh, devastating knee injury. The documentary is called Whatever It Takes, and it's on Sportsnet. You can find it online. Um, and he's a guy that put in a tremendous amount of work to keep his, his workload and his fitness high while he was recovering from injury. So he could hit the ground running when he was ready to uh, return to play. He didn't have to make up that cardio once he was finally cleared to play. He was ready to go. LeBron James, you'll see at the top there, love him or hate him. He's a guy that's uh, extremely well known for um, you know, spending lots of money on his recovery, uh, millions of dollars on his recovery every year. Uh, he's had extreme longevity in the NBA, and he is going to break the all-time uh, scoring record that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar currently holds in the NBA, which is phenomenal. Uh, two of the unarguable greatest of all time basketball players, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, again, known for their insane work ethic, never getting out of shape. Um, and there you see a little picture of Connor McDavid uh, working on his knee rehab down in the corner here. So we'll come back to this Goldilocks approach to training. So if we look at the diagram down at the bottom here, we're going to start in the green square. Um, this is from uh, Tim Gabbett, some more of his research in the British Journal of Sport Medicine. So if we have adequate training loads, we get decreased soft tissue injury risk, so decreased injuries, and this leads to good performance. We also get high levels of fitness, which lead to uh, good performance and uh, reduced injury risk as well. If we contrast that, let's say we're under training, we have a low training load, uh, we get poor fitness, so our fitness doesn't improve, and that correlates with poor performance. If we overtrain, if we train too much, our training loads are too high, we do get high fitness, but we also get increased soft tissue injury risk, which again leads to poor performance. So we want to be right in the middle in that adequate training load. I'm going to present you with some quick evidence for undertraining. So poor fitness predisposes you to injury, so the training load is too low. Uh, and these are various studies I'll just go over relatively quickly. If you guys want to check them out further, check out the references at the end of the presentation. So amateur athletes with a poor VO2 max were greater than six times more likely to sustain an injury than those with a higher VO2 max. VO2 max is simply a measure of our oxygen uptake, which is a measure of our cardiovascular fitness. So athletes with worse cardio uh, were far more likely to get injured. Athletes with worse upper body strength and worse prolonged high intensity running ability were two to three times more likely to sustain an injury than fitter and stronger athletes. And rugby players who completed less than 18 weeks of training prior to their first injury were nine times more likely to sustain a subsequent injury. 
So this is presenting evidence that if we sustain an injury and we have a very high level of fitness, we can recover from that injury faster and we can, you know, decrease the chances of that injury coming back again to bite us just by keeping our fitness high before we get injured. It's very powerful stuff. Uh, so which factors separate robust from fragile athletes? So, you know, non-injury prone versus injury prone athletes. Uh, there's evidence to show higher aerobic fitness, speed, repeated sprint ability, and lower body strength all correlate with uh, protection against injury. And again, Tim Gabbett has a little quote, wrapping players in cotton wool will not bring on-field success. So we can't just minimize the injuries by training low because that's not going to improve our performance and not leave us competitive with other teams and other individuals. But we need to find that adequate training load, and that's what this is all about. Again, Tim Gabbett talks about returning safely from injury requires consideration of the workload completed. So part of our job as physiotherapists, when you are uh, coming to the clinic for us, we need to keep that cardio and that hockey specific fitness as high as possible throughout your rehab. We'll find creative ways to do that while we're working around your injury. So again, you can hit the ground running when you return to hockey. Uh, sometimes that's going to be tricky to do, but uh, you definitely want to make sure that whoever you're seeing for your rehab is keeping that in mind. What is some evidence for overtraining? Why don't we just train as hard as possible and uh, everything will be all good? Well, unfortunately, training too hard also leads to injury. So large changes in throwing load, greater than 60% in handball players, were associated with a two-fold increase in shoulder injuries. These injury rates and severity were also made worse by low uh, shoulder external rotation strength and scapular dyskinesis which means that the shoulder blade wasn't moving quite right. Different things that we check it in the clinic. <clears throat> a study by Gabbett demonstrated that when workload increases by 15% or more from one week to the next, the risk of injury jumps up by 50%. It's an extremely large jump for a 15% increase in training load. We're going to chat about what we want those weekly increases in training load to be in order to you know, maximize our performance, again, minimize injury. And again, we talked about this in a slide before, but that acute to chronic workload ratio explains 53% of injury likelihood with 47% being explained by other factors. You'll see in the diagram down on the right there, uh, this simply measures training load. It's documented on the bar graph there. And then the overlying line graph is injury rate. And you'll see as training load goes up and down, uh, injury rates correlate highly with, with the training load as well. We do want to be aware of some principles of training adaptations. You know, why do we have to actually train harder to get better? It seems simple, but we want to observe these principles. The first one is the progressive overload principle. High intensity training maximizes our performance via progressive overload. Uh, so the load must exceed our current capacity gradually over time to improve our performance. If we just keep working at the same rate that we are right now, and we never push our bodies beyond where we are, we don't adapt and we don't become stronger. Very simple concept. However, if the applied load greatly exceeds our tissue capacity, our tissue tolerance is exceeded and injury may occur. So again, we want to have that adequate training load, not too much, not too little. <clears throat> There's another principle called specific adaptations to impose demands, and this states that the adaptations are specific to the tissues and systems stressed with the training load. So, you know, if we do a hard upper body workout, we're not going to expect the fitness in our legs to get better. You know, conversely, if we do a tremendous amount of weight training, we're not going to expect our stick handling to get better in hockey. Okay, we need to work on specific skills in order to improve those specific skills. Across all sports, the majority of your training should be closely mimicking the sport as best as possible. And all your other, you know, training is supplementary to that. We keep the main thing, the main thing, focus on hockey and the specific skills and all the other weightlifting and sprinting and everything else is supplementary to that. Another principle is Wolf's Law. This has to do with uh, bone remodeling um, and it's been observed over the years, but originally by uh, a man with the last name Wolf from Germany. 
Uh, a healthy bone will adapt to training loads imposed upon it. This occurs via bone remodeling in response to an increase or decrease in load. So if we put more load on the bone, as long as it's, it's within acceptable recovery levels for us, we'll remodel and uh, increase the strength of that bone. And conversely, if we take load away, let's say a large period of inactivity, that bone is going to remodel to take bone away. So we're no longer adapted to that activity. So we're going to come back to the Goldilocks approach. How exactly do we determine what these adequate training modes are? <clears throat> so again, uh, we are going to chat about this acute to chronic workload ratio. And our acute load is going to be most easily measured by our session RPE method. So taking our rating of perceived exertion from 0 to 10, how hard do you feel you're working on average during that session from a scale of 0 to 10? times the number of minutes of activity that occurred. Uh, the chronic load is the four week average of these individual training sessions, RBEs. And again, the acute to chronic workload ratio is acute load over chronic load. This is a quick chart just demonstrating the rating of perceived exertion chart. Uh, so we can go all the way down from one, a minimum effort that can be carried on for, you know, forever, you know, seemingly no stop to it, having very simple conversations, certainly more than sleeping, but simple walk in the park, you can go all day, all the way up to 10, <clears throat> all out sprint, you can't talk, you can barely think, you know, the effort's sustainable for, for less than 30 seconds to a minute. Okay, uh, you guys can check into resources more on the RPE charts if you want, but very simple measure, zero to 10, how hard do you feel you're working over the course of that session? Going to give an example of calculating the acute to chronic workload ratio just so you can have an idea of what it looks like in practice so athletes one and two complete the same 90 minute hockey practice athlete one rates their current session as a seven out of ten on the rpe scale the session was 90 minutes long so we do seven times 90 that's 630 what we call arbitrary units um, and their chronic load, unfortunately, is only 400. So their average session load over the course of the last four weeks is only 400. So if we take 630, their acute load divided by 400, we get an ACWR, acute to chronic workload ratio, of 1.58. In contrast to that, athlete two rates their current session as a 5 out of 10 on the RPE scale. Um, and their chronic load is much higher. Um, so again, if we do the calculation there, the acute to chronic workload ratio is 0 0.95. So this is another study by Gabbett down on the bottom. It has found that uh, the sweet spot for both improving performance in regards to practice, as well as minimizing injury risk, uh, is anywhere from 0 0.8 to 1.3 acute to chronic workload ratio. So that's typically where we want to fall for the majority of our training sessions, okay? And again, that training load's gonna vary over time, but if we stick within that sweet spot, that's where we see the most success. So we see the athlete two, 0 0.95, they're well within that sweet spot, kind of on the lower end, so maybe they're not maximizing their performance too much. They're certainly not getting progressive overload in relation to their chronic workload, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, but they're definitely uh, minimizing their injury risk. Um, so maybe, you know, a training session on average for them that was a little bit towards that higher end, that 1.2 to 1.3 would be more beneficial for them. In contrast, athlete one at a 1.58 is uh, well into that danger zone where they're increasing their injury risk. So again, same two individuals, or sorry, different individuals, same practice, vastly different uh, ratings of perceived exertion based on the, the fitness that they're bringing into the practice. So we do have these individual differences, uh, and they're all variables that influence our load capacity. So variables that influence, you know, how we can tolerate uh, a training load that's thrown at us via given practice or weight training or dry land session or a game for that matter. Some of these factors are modifiable and some of them are non-modifiable. Some of the non-modifiable ones are things, simple things like age, gender, anatomical differences, so how long our bones are, what our hormonal profile is like, given our current age, you know, if we have any connective tissue disorders or any pre-existing medical conditions we can't tolerate, for example, asthma. 
these are things that we, we come in with that don't allow us to achieve the same level of fitness, we cannot modify. In contrast, there are many modifiable uh, risk factors that we can control. So our aerobic capacity, we can increase our cardio capacity, we can increase our strength, our neuromuscular control, our mobility, that's flexibility plus active control in there that we talked about in some previous presentations. And we can also modify our nutrition to, to eat healthy to support our recovery. Uh, all of these factors are modifiable via training consistently. Okay, So we want to stay ready so we don't have to get ready. Some other factors that modulate load capacity, mood, stress, sleep quality, general muscle soreness. But we can monitor these, uh, these via different surveys. We're going to go over an example uh, in just a couple slides. Just kidding, it's this slide, one slide. Uh, so this is an example from uh, research by Gazzano of a simple measurement of uh, monitoring recovery levels. So we'll see on the left side, we have different variables measuring our recovery, our fatigue, our sleep quality, our general muscle soreness, our stress levels, and our mood, uh, rating each from one to five. And uh, we, we can see vastly different ratings. So if we track down in the uh, bottom uh, right corner there, so athlete one circled in red, they have a rating of 14 out of 25, uh, which gives them 56% you know, recovery rate. And I apologize, but the other one, other one is covered up for me while I'm recording here, but uh, it's much better. The blue athlete has a, a much higher recovery level, recovery level. So these are simple measures that we can do at the start of each practice or at the start of each training load. We can do these ourselves as athletes. You can certainly administer them to your, your players if you're a coach or a parent. And it's an idea of you know, monitoring how recovered your athletes are. So. Maybe if somebody comes in with really poor recovery, we want to give them a lesser training load so we don't risk that overtraining on that particular day. And if somebody's consistently coming in with poor recovery levels, you know, we want to delve into specifics of that. Is it is there their mood that's low? You know, why is that occurring? We just want to have discussions with our athletes and with ourselves as to how we can modify those things, you know, how we can maximize our sleep quality, maximize our interpersonal relationships. Uh, enhance our you know, general muscle soreness post-activity through things like cooling down, full rolling, proper nutrition. Uh, we just want to have a, a real good gauge of how to manage our recovery. And we can only do that by tracking it. Here's a couple quick diagrams that just show how those individual factors, non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors, uh, pertain to our injury risk and our overall fitness. You guys can go over those really quickly yourself and certainly check the references. Uh, they're good conceptualizations. This one, and then there's this one as well. Uh, feel free to, to look at them a little bit more, again, with the references at the end of the presentation. So making sense of these numbers, hopefully everything is, is fairly simple so far. In order to increase the fitness, we want to observe progressive overload week to week on average. The sweet spot for progressive overload is one to 9% increase in training load per week. Okay, so we've got our week one training load, let's give it an arbitrary number of 400 on average. We wouldn't want to go any more than 9% to 10% above that week two. Uh, our research shows that, uh, you know, we, we want to keep that training load below 10%. So if it's below zero, if we're going backwards, you know, we're not getting that progressive overload. If it's above 10%, we're risking overtraining. That's what our, what our research tells us. <clears throat> we're going to talk about the concepts of the floor, the ceiling, and time. And this very much pertains to, you know, how we, how we program loads over the course of the season. So uh, this is a quote from another article. Uh, when developing rehabilitation or performance programs, three key concepts are critical the floor, the ceiling, and time. The floor represents the athlete's current capacity, so their level of fitness. The ceiling represents the capacity needed to perform the specific activities of the sport. So, for example, the, the uh, demands of an ice hockey game. And it is possible to safely progress an athlete from the floor, their current level of fitness, to the ceiling, their desired level of fitness, as long as the athlete is afforded enough time. Here's a visual representation of, of what that looks like. And we can go through a couple examples there. 
So if we go from left to right along the top, that second diagram where the, the ceiling is kind of moved up closer to that floor, it's giving us less time to adapt. So you'll see the, the slope of that training load. We have to have extremely rapid increases in training load in order to achieve that ceiling. And that's just not going to be tenable. Uh, we're going to risk overtraining. So in that case, we don't have adequate time. Uh, if we move another one uh, further to the right there, just next to that diagram we were talking about, if we move our competition date out further, of course, we can't change competition date. So really, we're moving our, our preparation uh, sooner, uh, highlighting the importance of off-season training. We're giving ourselves more time to adapt to that uh, specified training mode. Down on the bottom left, this is chatting about raising our floor. So again, the importance of off-season training and the importance of staying fit over time. If we're constantly just observing progressive overload over time, on average, that floor, that general level of fitness or that uh, chronic workload ratio is going to increase. And then it's much easier for us to, to get to the ceiling. But we don't have to work quite as hard to get there. If we extrapolate on that in a far right diagram, if we raise that floor up, we're going to raise the ceiling up even more. Our fitness can be so much higher than the demands of the game that you know we're going to have such a low risk of exceeding our tissue capacity and exceeding our fitness because the game's not going to throw anything at us that we haven't achieved in training. That's really the goal that we want as physios, as parents, as coaches, and as athletes is we want to be over prepared for the game. Uh, which is really hard to do when we don't train consistently. Uh, the middle diagram in the bottom there, that's an example of this concept of the basement. Again, in the off season, if our training falls off and our fitness becomes extremely low, we still have the same time period to prepare for, for these games. And again, even though the time hasn't changed, we're starting at a very overall low fitness level and we don't have adequate time to repair, to prepare rather. So let's delve into some uh, specific research to ice hockey, and we're going to wrap up here in uh, just a couple minutes. So measuring external load via accelerometers. So ice hockey players typically spend 39% of on-ice time gliding on two feet and 16% of time stride cruising to maintain a given speed. Some manufacturers of these accelerometer devices, no matter how fast we're going and our changes in speed, when we're you know, quick stops and starts like we have so often in hockey, in hockey. So some of these manufacturers suggest the use of specific metrics for ice hockey, on ice load and on ice load per minute, which only considers training loads that include accelerations above, above a specific threshold. So removing these periods of lower activity where we are gliding, where we are just simply striding to maintain our pace and we have a low, low energy output. Um, so that's kind of the gold standard for monitoring external load in ice hockey right now. And now we're going to talk about the accuracy of this session RPE. So we don't all have these fancy accelerometers that uh, NHL players are, are privy to and elite national teams are, are privy to. So can we just monitor our session RPE and assume it's kind of correlating highly with these accelerometers? Our research shows us that we can do exactly that. So the session RPE correlated highly with external load measurements via accelerometer and the time spent above 85% uh, of our max heart rate within individual elite male ice hockey players. Okay, So if an individual has one training session that's a little bit of a lighter load and they have a harder training session as measured on this external load, their session RPE is going to correlate to that within a single person. Interesting thing, again, highlighting the importance of these individual differences. Uh, the session RPE varies greatly between team members um, for, you know, given the external load. So even though we have the same external load, all the players go through the same practice, their rating of session RPE varies wildly. And that's depending on those individual difference, those modifiable, non-modifiable factors that we, we chatted about before. <clears throat> if we talk about training load position, this is uh, fairly interesting. So defensemen seem to have 
uh, higher levels of accelerations and decelerations than forwards in both game and a practice. So why would we be accelerating more and decelerating more, stopping faster and starting faster as defensemen? We'll just consider the reactionary aspect of this position. We're often reacting to moves that forwards are making, whereas forwards are, are more of the playmakers in the game. This is a simplification of things, but just my two cents as to, to why that may be. Uh, despite these defensemen having higher levels of acceleration and deceleration, uh, the session rating of perceived exertion is similar between forwards and defensemen. And this just shows that as athletes, we adapt to whatever practice demands we place upon ourselves. We're practicing all the time as defensemen, our bodies are going to adapt to defensemen. And if we're practicing all the time as forwards, our bodies are going to uh, adapt to that uh, demand of a forward position. This last bit of hockey research is very interesting. So higher training load, harder practices in elite uh, male ice hockey players at a national level has been documented in the following situations. So harder practices occur after a loss, after playing a top rank opponent, which may correlate with those losses as well, before playing an away game, and when preparing for a game against a weaker opponent. So if we look into those few things, you know, the the level of these difficulties of practices doesn't really seem to correlate to a bigger picture as to what we're preparing for, where our fitness is and where we want to be. We just seem to be reacting day to day, you know, punishing our athletes for a loss and using our anxiety about, a, about an away game to, to work extra hard right before a match, which arguably is just going to burn us out. So again, we want to step back from this reactionary emotional decision making as, as coaches and as players. As, as athletes as well with your individual training and use more of a scientific approach as best we can. So a summary of everything, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Our take home points, this is what you wanna remember, stay ready so you do not have to get ready. You have to train consistently, okay? We wanna keep that level of fitness up overall so that it's easier to maintain uh, compared to, to trying to increase it when we're, we're coming from that basement level from or off-season training. <clears throat> we also want to maintain these high workloads when injured as best as possible. Please chat with your physiotherapist about how you can best do that in a safe manner. We want to prioritize recovery by controlling these modifiable individual differences to enhance recovery. So again, train consistently, eat right, prioritize our sleep quality, interpersonal relationships, all those things we chatted about on the previous slide. As athletes, as parents and coaches, we want to monitor individual training sessions for the acute to chronic workload ratio, that magic range of 0 0.8 to 1.3. We also want to monitor weekly load increases, uh, less than 10%. Okay. As coaches, we can also consider preseason testing and screening to identify athletes that are predisposed to injuries via poor fitness. Uh, this can allow coaches and trainers to more closely monitor these athletes and uh, develop training protocols to, to bring them up to the ceiling as best as possible. Uh, some examples of this would be on-ice beep testing, strength testing, mobility testing, or motor control testing. Some of these things uh, we can do in the physiotherapy clinic. If you're interested, you can contact us, uh, and some things you can do on-ice as well. We also want to consider post-season testing to identify target areas for off-season training. So just like we do our tryouts at the end of the season, when you're done your season, consider some performance testing so that you can give your athletes a plan to take into the off season. You know, hey, you tested really weak on your upper body strength. I really want you to focus on that in the off season. Or, hey, you know, your cardio is really low despite playing at a high level. You did have some injuries this year. Let's really work hard this off season on training consistently to get that cardio up so we'll be good to go for next season. Of course, we're going to consider individual factors and use screening tools to gauge recovery. And we're going to adjust our session intensity based on signs of overtraining and undertraining. Again, some quick references for you guys if you want to look into uh, you know, the specific research a little bit more. More references. Have fun. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation again. Hope you guys have found all this content informative and educational. Uh, we loved working with Kitchener Minor Hockey as an organization. 
we will be sending out a survey in the next email. So, so look at that uh, to come from, from Ben in your email. Please complete our survey. Just allows us to have some feedback on what you guys enjoyed about the content, maybe some things you didn't like, and uh, what you potentially want to see in the future um, if we do this next year as well. Feel free to reach out with feedback or questions again to kmha at grsm.ca and all our past videos are available at the link below, Password Physiotherapy. Thanks again, guys. Pleasure working with you.